And good morning again. Good to see everybody out. If uh, Again, if you're visiting with us, we want to welcome you. And if you're following us on YouTube, we want you to be uh, continue following us. If you're in the area, we would be happy to have you here uh, with us. It's always a privilege for me to share God's Word with you. This morning, let's, let's see, I believe Patricia's got uh, Children's Church, so 12 and under. Anybody wants to go down for Children's Church? That's you guys, yeah. Got a good-looking crew coming. And while they're heading out, uh, 167, Pass Me Not, will be our hymn of invitation this morning, first and third verse of that hymn. Certainly. And as I was talking about, and, and it, it seems to become more and more apparent each year how quickly time flies by. Uh, when you look at the calendar, when I look at that certificate of ordination uh, that uh, I have down in my office, it says 2003, it just seems like yesterday uh, that that happened. Uh, 15 years has ticked off the clock that quick. And certainly it's been a privilege, all 15 years of those. In the 15 years, I've had several encounters that's been a little odd. I've shared those with you along. Remember the phone call, the errant phone call I made back at the Monument Company informing a guy that his father had passed away, and, and actually he hadn't, but the Lord had been moving on him to get back into church and, and those sorts of things. And a guy down in Georgia, much the same way. Well. This weekend, I had another one of those encounters, <laughs> oddly as it is. Carol and I were in Williamsburg helping Jared get caught up on his housework and getting his groceries in for the week. And, and I thought, well, I'll just take his truck over here to Pilot, fill it up, and that way he'll have gas to get back and forth where he needs to go. And I pull in, I'm filling up his truck, and I'm just standing there. I don't even know what I was doing, I don't remember. I was looking down, I know that much, and all of a sudden I hear, excuse me, sir. And I look over and I see a pair of bare feet, and as I scan on up, I see a gas can, and then I see a man about in his mid-30s. And he said, I was wondering if you could help me with a little gas. Uh, I'm heading to Iowa from Asheville. And I thought to myself, well, you're not gonna make it on that little can of gas, but if I can help you, I, I probably will. But I want to do a little investigating, so I, I talked to him just a little, and we walked over, and I said, what are you in? And he was in the, in a Dodge Durango, and sure enough, it was pulled up over to the gas pump, had a funnel stuck down in the, in the gas neck, and he had his gas can. I didn't notice if that vehicle was there when I pulled in or not, so I don't know if I was the third guy or the first guy or the 15th guy he would have been up to to ask. And, and I said, well, you're heading over to uh, Iowa? And he said, yeah, I'm taking them, and I never did see who them was until later. He said, then I'm going to drop them off, and then I'm coming back. I'm a journeyman electrician trying to get my journeyman's license. And so by that point, he'd set his can down in front of the gas pump, and I'd finished pumping gas in Jared's truck, and I'd put him $10 gas in there. And I said, well, just how do you plan on getting to Iowa from here on this little bit of gas? I said, are you going to depend on the generosity and kindness of strangers? And he said, well, yeah. I said, well, that's, that's good. I said, I hope you make it without too much trouble. And, and about the time I finished putting the $10 in, he said, plus I've got enough money for gas to get back on. I just wanted to not have to spend it going out. So, like, <laughs> okay. so it must be plastered there, though I don't see it in the mornings when I shave. Sucker must show in flashing neon lights. But I thought, well, okay, he's got me. I'm going to see what... I can do with him. And I've been sincere. And I says, well, how's your relationship with the Lord? And he said, well, you know, I consider myself a Christian. Though I don't go to church very much and I don't really pray. And I guess I drink too much beer. And I live with a lady. And he said, I'm probably not what they would call a good Christian. And that's when I took the opportunity to tell him just something simple because I knew where we were at. I wasn't going to have a lot of time and the look of horror on his face when I asked him that question, like, oh my gosh, for $10, I've, $10 worth of gas, I've got to hear a sermon. And I even told him that. I said, so whoever you're riding with, you can tell them for this 10 bucks worth of gas, this guy had to, to preach to you. So, But I said, Jesus Christ is the most important relationship that you can have. I said, this world is going to end someday, and we're all going to stand before his throne. 
of judgment. He's either going to be the prosecuting attorney or he's going to be our defense attorney. And I said, you for sure want him to be your defense attorney. I said, good luck on your trip. Remember what I said about developing your relationship with the Lord and be sincere in that, and I hope you make it through <coughs> anyway. And I, I turned around and finished up my transaction, got in the truck, and I drove around the pump, and I just I didn't really mean to do it this way, but I was kind of in the middle. He was on the very end, and I seen who them was. Uh, it was a dog and his girlfriend, and she had one of these big, and, and I mean no offense by this, I know other, no other way to describe one of these big 1960s hippie hats and, and long coats kind of thing on it. <laughs> And he was doing this boogie boogie look, and I thought, well, he's telling her about me as I drive around the corner, and she's <laughs> laughing. So, but it was in that conversation that something stuck with me, and that's the title of this morning's sermon: "I Consider Myself a Christian." I would like for you to turn in the Gospel of John, chapter eight, verse twenty-one. And we're going to look at this a little deeper this morning. We're going to read, it's not a terribly long passage, but it's 21 through 30. The Bible says, Then Jesus said again unto them, I go my way, and you shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whither I go, you cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he hath saith, Whither I go, you cannot come. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Then said they unto him, Well, who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you. But he that sent me is true, and I speak the word, I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he, he and he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that pleaseth him. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Now this young man that I've seen at Pilot had enough background that he, or he had been asked that question enough, he knew what the answers that Christians want to hear, I guess. He knew enough to say, I consider myself a Christian, but I don't go to church, I don't pray, and I drink too much beer, and I live with my girlfriend. So that tells me he has a background somewhere to know that assembling together, not forsaking your, the assembly of yourselves together, is important. That prayer is the line of communication for ministers, of Christians, and that we as Christians should avoid sin. That's what I got from his conversation and his statement. But in line of what he said and these scriptures that we just read, we see that sometimes, uh, just like Jesus is telling this group of people that they would die in their sins. Group, and he's telling this group of people here that he's talking to that he's going to go one place and they're going to go another and they cannot be there three times, in fact. And it's not shocking so much that Jesus says this if you're thinking that they're unsaved Gentiles, but that's not who he's speaking to. He's speaking to people that would consider themselves righteous, kind of like I consider myself a Christian statement in the same context here. If you flip back to chapter 3, verse 19 in John, Jesus says this, And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Jesus brought light into, world, into the world, and he brought the examples of love and compassion, and most importantly, salvation, which we discussed around the table this morning. 
But as the scripture says, they refuse to come to the light. They refuse to acknowledge the light. And they refuse to obey the righteousness that is associated with that. Much like the young man did. Knowing all of the signs being there, but yet being of the world. Now we can kind of see what Jesus is talking about a little better. How does that happen? How is it that you have enough background in the, about church and God that you know how to answer the questions or you really know the answer to the questions just like these uh, Jews asked Jesus, well, who are you? Are you going to go someplace we can't go? Is he going to kill himself? They had enough background through the prophets just like this young man had enough background probably from upbringing but I want to look this morning a little closer. And let's start off back in 8, verse 21. Jesus says this, I go my way, and you shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, you cannot come. The first way to consider yourself a Christian, and I think it's important to say this, I may consider myself a Christian, but the most important thing is, does God consider me a Christian? Does Jesus Christ consider me a Christian? Does my life reflect evidence that I am a Christian? Because if you notice, it says, you cannot glorify yourself in Christ at the same time. To be self-righteous is one way to be on the wrong side of this conversation that Jesus is having here. And that's the first step in dying in your sins that he told them three times, is that you think you don't have a problem with sin. Being perfectly happy with the condition that you're in, you really have no need for a Savior because what you're doing is not an issue. It's really not a problem that I don't go to church, that I don't pray, that I drink too much beer, and I live with my girlfriend. That wasn't a problem with this guy. Even so much, he made light of it, I presume, whenever he got his gas and, and I left. To be self-righteous. That's one way that, that Jesus is talking about dying in your sins. They were going to different places, you recall. said they would seek him, but they would not find him. He was going to the Father, his Father, our Father, which is in heaven. And these religious people would be eternally separated from that relationship. So what could this mean? One alternative, isn't it? If you're separated from God eternally, what does that mean? There's only one place of separation, and that's hell. And Jesus is pronouncing what happens and how that process works. In chapter 7, uh, verse 34, he announces the doom of the unforgiven sinner. You shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am, thither you cannot come. And they didn't understand that. In verse 22, he says, Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he is Seth, whither I go, you cannot come. Well, understand in Orthodox Judaism, if a person commits suicide, they go to the darkest part of eternity. Josephus wrote about that, that they would be separated from the place of comfort. And for the Jew, that's the bosom of Abraham. So Orthodox Judaism, we see now the basis of their question. Why they would have thought if... He makes this statement, the only logical system for that to happen is for Christ to kill himself, to which they had no intent of doing. We can see when you're self-righteous. So they had it backwards. They thought they would be in heaven and Jesus would be in hell. Boastful pride, and we can see that. We see that in people that we know. We see that maybe even in ourselves at times. And, we, and when we recognize that, it's my prayer that we, we stuff that away. We put, take care of that. So maybe you know somebody that doesn't, uh, that thinks they don't have a problem with sin. Maybe you know someone that's depending on religion and enough good credits and enough good deeds to get you through. Well, without the blood of Christ, let me say this. Without the blood of Christ, you can't be good enough to go to heaven. You can't do enough good deeds to go to heaven and be forgiven of your sin. That's the simple fact. And sin is a problem for every one of us. Every one of us in this room and every one of us outside those doors. 
The only way you're not going to have a sin problem is when you're standing beside of Jesus Christ at his judgment throne. That's when sin's no longer going to be a problem. You're going to be judged for it or you'll be forgiven of it. Plain and simple truth. And that's what we see here. Being self-righteous. Uh, it's a dangerous place to be, dying in your sins. Verse 23, and Jesus said unto them, You are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. In verse 44, he goes on to say, You are, are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. Now, if I couldn't make it plain and clear, I'm certain that Jesus just did. Okay? And that's what we have to realize. We are, cannot walk a thin line between heaven and hell between Christ and the world, between our physical lust and our spiritual desires. You cannot split that. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. So self-righteous is to die. That's one way to die in your sins. And also 23 again is to be worldly. And just talking about that, being of this world. Now the Greek word used here is cosmos, which means system, the world system, verse 23. You are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, this system, Jesus says. I am not of this system. What is that system? We just read it in 44. The, being led and controlled by the devil, the father of all lies, the murderer from the beginning, he says. And what do we see in our world today? Has he changed? No. There's been no change. In the world system... And thank goodness and thank the Lord above, there's been no change in God either. He still loves us as much today as he did yesterday as the first day of creation. And as much as he will the day that he sends Jesus back for us. Matthew 13, 22 says this. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceit and the fullness of riches choke the word and become, and he becometh unfruitful. That describes a worldly person. I think we've got it up here. A little different uh, version, but I thought it was pretty mean. You cannot focus on the kingdom of God while tangled up in the thorns of this life. I thought that was pretty good. And we've been tangled up, haven't we? Every one of us here have been tangled up in the thorns of this life at some time or another. And you cannot focus on the kingdom of God, the things that we're supposed to be doing when you're tangled up in thorns. Anybody that walks through a field, especially if you go rabbit hunting, and you're walking through them briars and brambles, I've done it a hundred times. My pants are testament of it. There is no pants at the bottom down there. The thorns tear and pull and trip you up trying to walk through. And you have to pay particular attention to what you're doing or you'll end up like I have ended up on several occasions on your back or on your face looking up at the sky. And it's the same way with what we're talking about spiritually here. When we get ourselves hung up with these thorns, when we get ourselves caught up with the cares of the world as Jesus was talking about in the parable, the next thing you know you're flat of your back looking up saying, Lord, save me because what have I done? I've become tangled up in the cares of this world to the point that now I'm coming back to repent so I can get my life back in order. And that's a wonderful thing if you do that. But if you are of this world, as we've talked about here, then that's another way that Jesus is talking about with these people, that you die in your sins. Because rest assured, all of these men, all of these Jews that he was speaking to would have considered themselves righteous. Just like the young man at Pilate, I consider myself a Christian. And Jesus is outlining to them the things that the young man outlined to me. Here's where I fail. He acknowledged it. These folks are thinking, he's crazy. He's going to kill himself. He's going to be in hell. We're going to be in heaven. Poor fellow. And we can see that the world system fails. <coughs> 
but people follow after it still like there's a mean of salvation there as Christians we have to be crucified to this system don't try to be dark and light try to be light and dark because remember what's the Bible tell us about two masters no man can serve two masters because he will cling to one and despise the other one. That's the same way with darkness and light. That walking, splitting, that fence. You're going to despise one side and you're going to cling to the other. Period. What about be unbelieving? Verse 24. Jesus goes on and says, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Now, this is opening the doors to salvation for this group. Believe on Jesus. Believe who he is. Believe why he came. Believe, understand why he had to die. And understand why it was necessary for him to be resurrected in all of the scriptures that that fulfilled. Acts 16.31 says this. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Believe and you be saved. Does that mean that all you have to do is believe? No. That's not what that means. But belief is the beginning, right? Faith cometh by what? Hearing. Hearing is the word of God. And once you hear, you believe. Once you believe, you continue on and you move forward and you obey what the gospel says to do. That's what we see when Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost. They heard, they believed, and they cried out what? What must we do to be saved? And what did Peter tell them? Repent and be baptized. He didn't say you're already saved just because you believe. He said repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what he said. So belief is the first requirement because it leads to other the remaining obedience. But this is not what the religious leaders think. Why do you think Jesus had to say that? If you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Again, there that statement is. Because without belief, there is no salvation. Jesus said in John 3, verse 36, <coughs> This, or is I'm sure I'm in the right spot here. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John wrote that about Jesus. If you don't believe, then you will die in your sins and eternally separated from God. Which brings us up to our last point. Verse 25. And then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning, willfully ignorant. Wouldn't that amaze you, or doesn't that amaze you? It does me to think that they ask him that question. Well, who are you anyway? I'm the same guy I said I was from the beginning. Doing the same things that I told you from the beginning. Basically is what Jesus is telling them here. They had seen or heard of his healing, feeding the masses, walking on the water, turning water into wine. The incredible power that God had given them, yet they say, just who are you anyway? Pretty amazing statement. If you look over chapter 9, verse 30. No man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing that you know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened my eyes. You, are you familiar with what that is? Jesus healing the blind man. Probably the same group of people saying, Well, where do you get that power? And the blind man himself says, You guys really don't know? Of course, this is me paraphrasing. You really don't know where... He gets this power and who this is from, and yet you know that I've been blind my whole life, but now I see, and you're questioning? Really? Willfully ignorant. 
refusing to look at the things that are in front of us. What was they worried about? You know what the main thing that that group of people was worried about? If you look at that story, it was that Jesus healed that man on the Sabbath day. That was it. It didn't matter that they had just witnessed God's son, empowered by God himself, give vision back to a man that they knew had been blind. The fact was, what? Mm, you did that on the Sabbath day. You must be of the devil. Isn't that a sight? But don't people do that just the same today? Oh, he says he's a Christian, but did you see or hear what he did? That old Rob gave that hippie boy and girl $10 worth of gas, and they just laughed at him as he drove off. He's a fool. No? He's just pretty gullible. But I wanted to take the opportunity to share Jesus Christ with them if they never had it shared before. And I hope that somewhere between Williamsburg, Kentucky, and wherever he's heading in Iowa, those words echo in his mind. That's a long drive. That's my hope. I didn't expect him to come to Jesus right there at the pilot gas station. But I expect the Lord to work on him between here and there. Because he's got to get gas from somebody. Unless he comes out and... And this continues. I, won't, I should have told him, don't you tell nobody about that little roll of money you got saved up to get back home because that's going to hurt your chances of getting there. Okay? But in the process of him getting there, I am in prayer, and I'll ask him to be in prayer. I don't know the guy's name. I don't have a clue. Uh, Black Dodge Durango with Massachusetts plates is what he's driving. If you see him, track him down. <laughs> Ask him how his relationship with the Lord is. You'll recognize his passenger. One's real hairy and one's got a big hat. <laughs> but pray for him. Pray that God takes the opportunity that maybe, I don't even know if I started it. I don't know that somewhere between Williamsburg and Asheville he didn't stop at another gas station. Another Christian might not have told that man the same exact thing or asked him the same exact question. So we don't know how God operates. And we don't know how many times he's going to encounter Jesus between here and Iowa. And if that means that these 50 Christians gives him $10 of gas between here and there and it finally sinks in, then it's worth it, isn't it? Because to be willfully ignorant will cause you to die in your sins. And Jesus makes it clear all the way through this. Well, verse 25. Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. Jesus says who he is. And then look at verse 26 through 29. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. And they understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. He had more to say and more to judge. And when they would crucify him, they would know who he was. They would recognize. They may not acknowledge it. The centurion recognized it, didn't he? You remember that? Truly this was the Son of God. They knew who it was. They polled, paid the soldiers, if you look a little bit in history, not to say that he arose. <laughs> they were witnesses to the church being born. They saw the power of God through the disciples preaching and healing. They persecuted the church, yet they saw Saul converted from one of them to a Christian. Willfully ignorant. Do you see what he's talking about in the, in the whole scope and scheme of things? But then in 30 is the whole hope to this passage. Not all of these people 
were self-righteous, worldly, willfully ignorant. And as he spake these words, many believed on him. And what happens when people believe? We just read it. They're saved. Because once they believe, they continue to read and believe and, and listen more. And they find out that, okay, I believe who Christ is. Now I must repent of my sin. And I have to confess him as my Savior. and have to be buried with him in baptism for the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then I have to continue on faithful until either he returns to take me away or my hands are folded in death. That's what belief brings. And that's what Jesus is saying here. And that's the whole point of the message. Many believed on him. Just as anyone that's here without Christ can believe it on him this morning. By using and having heard this example here of Jesus' preaching. Because we may have someone here that's never obeyed the gospel. Maybe you're here and you've never obeyed the gospel, but yet you believe Jesus shows us, our lesson shows us that belief is not enough. But belief is the beginning. And if that's you this morning, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation, Pass Me Not. I want to encourage you to come and sing. But now, maybe you're a Christian and you realize some of the things that, that Jesus is teaching to, the, to these Pharisees applies to me. My God. I understand it. I get it because I'm right in the middle of that. Well, let me encourage you to do this. Repent. Don't be willfully ignorant. Don't turn. Don't be worldly. Don't be self-righteous, certainly, and think that you don't have a sin problem because we already identified that everyone here has a sin problem. And you can change that right where you sit. You don't have to come down because, listen, it's not between you and me. It's really not. You can come and tell me all of the terrible things you've done, a list big enough to fill up that screen. And I do not have one ounce of power to forgive you for that stuff. But I know the guy that does. So you can, you can repent, you can get yourself back in order with the Lord. And I encourage you to do that. Now if you want support from me and your brothers and sisters in Christ, certainly come. I'm not telling you not to come down. But you don't owe me anything, but you owe Jesus everything. We're going to sing this hymn of invitation, Pass Me Not, 167, the first and the third verse. If you have a decision to make, would you come as we stand and sing?